Hello everyone, my name is Shama Prasad and I'm here with Team One representing McMaster University. We'll take you through the site initiation visit presentation in the next few minutes. Thank you for joining us. Our clinical trial is a double-blind, placebo-controlled, two-part study to investigate the dose range in safety and pharmacokinetics, followed by the efficacy and safety of cannabidiol in children and young adults with Dravet syndrome that has been approved by Health Canada and REB. We will be discussing the following topics, the roles and responsibility of different members in the site and communication flow, Protocol overview explains the type, objectives, goals, recruitment plan, and eligibility criteria of the study. In general, study procedures will give a detailed explanation of patient walkthrough, study visits, and schedule of events. The safety section covers the definition and procedures related to collecting and reporting safety-related data. For data collection and source documents, we'll be explaining the method and their importance respectively. Investigational medical product includes all the relevant information about our study drug. Clinical monitoring provides you with a detail of contacts, responsibility, frequency, and close-up procedures. Investigate a site file review to ensure the study compliance. And finally, closing and reviewing action items explains the steps, actions, and documentation to close out the trial. The roles and responsibility of site members. First, the principal investigator is responsible for conducting the clinical study on the site as per the protocol, inform consent and assent and enrollment process of the patient, ensuring the data integrity, the right safety and well-being of the study patients are protected, over signs of the study activity and site personnel. Co-investigator's responsibility includes confirming the eligibility of patients by screening procedures, prescription of the study drug, and the serious adverse events, adverse events grade identification. Study nurse responsibility are to check concomitant medication, any AE, vital signs, patient treatment, physical assessment, and collection of data to the source document. Clinical research coordinator's responsibility are patients' recruitment, screening procedures, training caregivers to fill interactive voice response system and daily diary, case report form filling, packing and shipping of blood samples to the central lab, following the screening procedures and to schedule and remind the study visits to patients, ensuring the safety of enrolled patients, continuing participation, ensuring the trial is conducted ethically and maintaining proper and up-to-date documents, monitoring the trial procedures and ensuring all documents are checked and updated before the inspection and the study closure. The ethic coordinator's responsibility lies in the maintenance and submission of regulatory documents and safety reporting. Pharmacist will be responsible for the storage, dispense, accountability, and further requirements of IMP. Laboratory staff responsibility include the collection of blood and urine samples. Clinical research associates responsibility is to monitor the study and data collection, double check the data collected with source documents. You're welcome to contact the GWP vendors. The name, email, and phone numbers are listed below. For documents and monitoring related queries, please contact the CRA. And please contact the ESC for the screening and confirmation of Travis syndrome. The pharmacovigilance department will guide you concerning adverse events related queries. For IP orders, dispense, and additional supplies, please contact GW Pharmaceuticals. For any queries related to blood and urine sample transportation, please contact Central GW Laboratory for more details. Any question related to IVRS activation, randomization, audit, please contact the CTM. Hello everyone, I'm Jose Luis and I'm going to give you an oversight of our protocol. Our study is a phase 3 part B multicenter clinical trial with a total duration of almost 24 weeks, with a 14-week treatment phase duration. It's a double-blinded one-to-one randomized clinical trial with a treatment and control arm, comparing the study drug and placebo in participants with uncontrolled seizures, associated with Dravet syndrome. The main study objective is to assess the efficacy of the study drug as an adjunctive treatment when compared to a placebo in convulsive seizure frequencies. The secondary objectives are to evaluate changes from baseline in seizures, use of rescue medication, hospitalization, sleep evaluation, quality of life, menstruation, development, behaviors, plasma concentration of concomitant antiepileptic drugs, and assess the safety of the study drug. 
the enrollment goal is 100 participants, 50 participants for each arm of the study, and with participation of 30 centers distributed in five countries mentioned here, with five sites in Canada. To reach these goals, we will have four streams as a recruitment plan, site database, physician, media, and community outreach. As key inclusion criteria, participants to be eligible, they must give informed consent and follow the study requirements, be between 2 and 18 years old, have four or more convulsive seizures during the baseline period, at least four weeks of stable dose treatment, and completion of an interactive voice response system in at least 25 of 28 days of baseline. Here is the complete inclusion criteria list as per protocol section 6. As key exclusion criteria, participants may not enter in the study if they have an abnormal clinical condition, laboratory values, or AKG results, history of alcohol or drug abuse, current or past use of cannabis, allergy related to any study drug components, or type 4 or 5 on the Colombian suicide severity rating scale. Here is the complete exclusion criteria list as per protocol section 6. Let's talk about the schedule of events. The study will start with a screening evaluation, which consists of one on-site visit. After screening, the baseline period comes. The information about participant seizures will be recorded by the patient's caregiver at home for 28 days. Then, a baseline on-site visit will be held. Successful participants will be randomized in the same visit. Treatment period duration is 14 weeks. The initiation of the study drug will start at the end of the baseline visit. Participants will receive an standard treatment regimen of 11 days. The treatment period involves four on-site visits and two telephone calls with a visit window of three days for each visit. After the end of treatment visit, B8 visit, the taper period will begin with a duration of 10 days. This will be interrupted if the participant decided to participate in the extended study. At the end of tapering, the participant will come to the study visit number B9. End of taper. Next, follow-up period started with a duration of four weeks, with weekly follow-up safety calls and a last on-site study visit B10, which could be performed by telephone call as well. It's important to emphasize that informed consent must be obtained prior to studying any study-related procedures. The screening and baseline BC procedures are listed in this chart. Please refer to protocol section 9 to review it in detail. We must bear in mind that postural blood pressure will be assessed after 5 minutes in supine position and if possible 2 minutes in a standing position. Also, blood pressure must be recorded in the same arm throughout the study. The diagnostic review form DRF will be sent to the epilepsy study consortium ESC to see confirmation of diagnosis that could take up to 14 days. The DRF will include a detailed description of the participant's seizures, behavior before the seizure, possible triggers during the event, changes in muscle tones, movement, automatic or repeated, the color of the skin, loss of urine or bubble control, alteration of awareness, part of the body involved, and seizure classification. Any patient identifiers need to be redacted. The SCN1A analysis will be carried out only if the mutation status of SCN1A is unknown preferably at the screening visit. However, blood samples for this analysis can be taken at any visit during the study. Pregnancy tests will be done only in women of childbearing age. Tanner staging between 10 to less than 18 years old or elderly if clinically indicated. Caregivers of female patients should be asked about menstruation. We have to have in mind that three to five working days after the visit, the lab result will be received and participants with abnormal value will be notified by telephone and will be withdrawn for the study. This is the list of questionnaires that will be assessed. I would like to point out the following. A sleep disruption. If the main caregiver is not, avail is not available at the appropriate visit, then this information can be captured over the telephone within three days. Quality of life in childhood epilepsy, HOLSI, in children between 4 to 18 years old. Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, CSSRS, will be due preferably in children of 6 years of age and older and capable of, uh, capable of understanding and answering questions. A screening visit walkthrough. 
The first step is the unique participant number, UPN, and demographics. The principal investigator will allocate a UPN for each participant. From here, only the UPN will be used for identifying the participant. The CRC will complete the attendance log and will obtain demographic information from the patient. This confirms because it is basic information of participants. Next, vital signs and postural blood pressure will be measured by the study nurse as well as the EKG technician will perform EKG. These procedures will be done in the triage room and come before the patient meets the principal investigator to evaluate the result for eligibility. After that, medical history, concomitant medication, and CSSRS will be performed by the principal investigator in the physical examination room. The principal investigator will evaluate and compare until this point the results with exclusion criteria before continuing. In the same room, the principal investigator will perform the physical examination. Then, laboratory blood and urine samples, SCN1A test, THC screen and pregnancy test will be performed by the study laboratory technician in the sampling room part of the laboratory area. Please ensure to do all no invasive evaluations before performing invasive one like blood testing. Finally, the CRC will gather all the information to complete the DRF and CRF based on the source document field in each procedure. The CRF should be completed within five days. The principal investigator will evaluate if the DRF and CRFs are completed correctly. The principal investigator will send an email with the DRF to the ESC for double syndrome confirmation. Also, the principal investigator will decide if the participant will continue to the baseline period. The CRC will train eligible participants caregivers for using IBRS and how to complete the daily diary. Now, baseline basic walkthrough. At this point, the principal investigator will have a confirmed diagnosis of Dravet syndrome provided by the ESC. The CRC will review the IBRS data for more than four convulsive seizures and at least 25 data entry during baseline period. Also, the CRC will complete the attendance log of the day. If the participant is still eligible, then Vital signs, postural blood pressure, and AKG will be performed again, again as explained before. Next step with the procedures done by the principal investigator remain the same as a screening visit, but in addition, information about hospitalization, usage of rescue medication, adverse event administration will be asked. In addition, also, tender staging will be performed. Eligible participants until this point will continue. Next, about laboratory procedures, instead of SCN1A analysis, insulin-like row factor 1 levels will be measured. In addition, the laboratory technician will draw a NOP sample for plasma antiepileptic drug concentration too. If the participant is eligible, the CRC will, be, uh, will randomize them in the IBRS in the office room. I would like to emphasize that size needs to confirm eligibility once they receive the lab result from the central lab too. The CRC will ask only eligible participants to go to the mirroring room for the next step. The following questionnaires that can be seen in step 7 will be completed by the caregiver in the meeting room. The CRC will be present there to answer any doubts the caregiver may have about the questionnaires. The CRC will complete the CRF within five days based on the source document, and the principal investigator will ensure that the CRF is correct and will sign it. The principal investigator will allocate a dosing schedule to be el two eligible participants, and the dosing schedule will be explained by the CRC to the participant. The study drug will be dispensed by the pharmacies in the medication delivery area. The treatment visits, including the taper period and follow-up and the respective procedures at each visit, are listed in this chart. Please refer to protocol section 9 to review it in detail. Now, treatment visit walkthrough. Almost the same steps as baseline visit will be followed during the treatment visits. The steps and procedures depend on the number of visits performed based on the schedule of assessment. For example, there are more procedures in visit B8 than other visits. I would like to accentuate that. The IBRS and participant diaries will be reviewed at the beginning of each on-site visit. Caregiver impression of um, the study drug palatability or IMP palatability questionnaire is included here. 
about telephone call was through, which includes visit B5, B7 safety calls and optional B10 as this visit can be performed by call or on site. Uh, that during, during the safety telephone calls, the CRC will obtain the information in the following order. Concomitant medication. As this information is easy to remember because it's current, uh, it will be as first. The CRC will record the information in the concomitant medication log, log including the drug name, dose unit, how it's indicated, dose form, road of the administration, and start date. Second, the CRC will ask about epilepsy-related hospitalization, about where a number of, of hospitalizations start and end date, usage of rescue medication, and will be completed in the hospitalization log part in the CRF. In the end, the CRC will ask about the adverse events, as this is the least pleasant topic to remember, as well as it can create confusion in relating effects between their baseline medication and the study drug. This information will be completed in the adverse event log inside the CRF, and it includes names of the adverse events, severity, starts and end date, and relation to the study drug. I'm Anusha, and I will cover topics on safety, data collection, and source documentation. Feel free to ask any questions you may have. What's an adverse event? An adverse event in our study is defined as any new unfavorable event that happens from the time of screening to the last safety follow-up visit. An adverse event may be classified as serious if it falls into any of these criteria. Medically significant events are events that may require intervention to prevent such an outcome. For example, intensive treatment in the ER or at home for allergic bronchospasm. Reporting procedures. The research coordinator will record information in the adverse event section of the case report form within five days of the patient's visit. The investigator will review and sign the CRF. All serious adverse events are to be recorded on the SAE forms and faxed to GW within 24 hours. Moving on to causality. For all adverse events, including SAEs, the following yes or no question must be answered by the investigator to capture a reasonable causal relationship of an event to the IMP on with the factors mentioned here. What should be recorded? You will record uh, the following information in the AE section of the CRF. For adverse events, diagnosis or syndrome if known, or signs and symptoms must be entered if the diagnosis is unknown at the time of entry. Once the diagnosis or the prevention diagnosis is available, it should be updated sometimes along with symptoms and signs. For example, fever and malaise due to respiratory tract infection. Here are some special circumstances that need reporting specific to our study. Pregnancy, yes, the investigator must report any pregnancy to GW within 24 hours of awareness. Where possible, you must provide the outcome of the pregnancy as well. The other one would be potential case of drug-induced liver injury. The investigator will submit laboratory results to GW's pharmacovigilance department within 24 hours for any patient that meets the following criteria after randomization. These patients will be considered potential cases of drug-induced liver injury and be withdrawn from the study. Listed here are criteria for withdrawal. Some of them specific to our study include pregnancy, any adverse event that could compromise the safety of our patients, such as drug-induced liver injury or suicidal ideation and behavior. Listed here are the follow-up procedures. The investigator will follow up all adverse events until resolution and provide all follow-up information to GW. If the patient must be removed from treatment or if the patient decides to withdraw, the patient must undergo end-of-treatment assessment and be given appropriate care under medical supervision until the symptoms stop or until the condition becomes stable. Notification of safety information. 
The sponsor will provide the CRAs or the CTMs, clinical trial monitors, safety reports such as SUSARs, who will in turn provide them to the investigators and research coordinators. After receiving, you will then submit them to the REB on time, as required by the local REB reporting requirements. The contact information for GW's pharmacovigilance department and timelines for reporting are mentioned here in this slide. Moving on to data collection and source documentation. What is a source document? Source documents are original documents, data, and records from which the patient's CRF is obtained. Source data should be entered into the CRF as soon as possible. This will be done by the person designated by the investigator. The source documents stay on site in the patient's research chart. Specifically, in our study, the research coordinator will train patients on how to use the diary, the IVRS, and the questionnaire. In diary, the, the, for diaries, the research coordinator will instruct the patients on how to enter these information onto their diary. Source data for assessments collected through IVRS will be managed by a separate service provider. The research coordinator will instruct caregivers to call the IVRS at this phone number and follow prompts to enter the seizure information. The seizure information, the frequency and the type of seizure will be trained by the investigator at the time of screening. Listed here are the questionnaires used in our study. It's important to note that the same caregiver must complete them. The CSSRS form will be completed by the investigator. A case report form is a document that's designed to record all the protocol required information about the patient. Although the information may be entered by the study nurse or the research coordinator, the final responsibility rests with the investigator. The time frame to complete is five days. Some general guidelines for data entry and data correction are each CRF page must include these. The CRF pages should be identified only by the patient's unique study identifier. You must write clearly and legibly using blue or black ballpoint pen. If data is not available or if you need to make a correction, draw a single line through and mention why the item was not available or enter the correct value near the original entry. Any strike through should be initialed and dated and it must be readable. In this case, I can still see the reading was 55.1. Special attention, please be aware of the hospital's infection control policy during these COVID times when moving reports in and out of the rooms. Thank you. Over to Tina now. Hi, I'm Tina. I'll be covering the investigational product, clinical monitoring, and closeout. These slides contain supplemental information, all of which is in the protocol. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. The study investigational medication is an oral solution in sesame oil and ethanol. It's flavored with sucralose and strawberry. The active ingredient is CBD or cannabis oil. CBD is part of the cannabis plant, but it does not contain pleasure-inducing addictive properties. The placebo product matches the study medication, except it does not contain CBD. GW manufactures packages and labels each IMP with a unique packet identification number that identifies the medicinal content. In terms of storage, the IMP should be kept upright, room temperature, away from heat and direct sunlight. Any unused IMP should be thrown away 12 weeks after opening the bottle. These requirements apply to both the patient home and your approved IMP storage location. Table 1.0 outlines your IMP ordering and temperature control requirements. 
It's important to note that the IMP will be sent to you after your site activates the IVRS, but then you'll need to order it manually. Once the IMP is received, you must monitor the storage temperature daily and immediately notify the CRA of any deviations of your storage condition requirements. You will dispense the IMP to patients and caregivers at visits B2, 4, 6, and 8. GW will provide you with IMP instruction sheets and videos, which the CRA will review with you. These resources should be provided and carefully reviewed with patients and caregivers. Some of the most important aspects you should emphasize with patients and caregivers are to use the syringe provided with the IMP, take the IMP twice daily, the medication is to be swallowed, record usage, titration adherence will be monitored for safety, and take the IMP with concomitant medications only as you've directed. You should let them know to follow the dosing instructions carefully. The dose starts low, titrates up to a target dose that should be maintained for the treatment period, then it is titrated down slowly. If the IMP is not tolerated well, the study investigator may stop or adjust the dosage. You should be clear that they are to only adjust dosing as instructed. Provide complete preparation, administration, and cleanup instructions. Collect all used, partially used, and empty IMP containers from patients and caregivers at visits before 6, 8, and 9. Send everything you receive to GW, or if you wish to destroy the IMP on site, this must be approved in writing. Reconcile the returned IMP with the reported usage and your projected usage. Discuss and document any usage discrepancies. You'll also maintain a drug accountability record. You will work with the CRA for IMP provision and storage and provide drug reconciliation statement to, to the CRA and GW at study end. Treatment assignment unblinding should only occur if it is essential to make a medical management decision. Unblinding for any other reason is a protocol deviation. Table 1.0 outlines the options for information containment. You must ensure unblinding information is available when needed. If unblinding does occur, document the details and notify GW. The CRA is responsible for monitoring the safety and potential risks to patients and providing oversight on clinical trial quality. I've already discussed the CRA with regards to the IMP. This list outlines other CRA responsibilities. For instance, she will provide assistance and be a direct communication link between you and the sponsor. Every four weeks, her other responsibilities are to monitor for any protocol deviations and ensure that all important data is complete, legible, accurate, consistent, and recorded in a timely manner. There will be centralized and on-site visits as outlined in the monitoring plan. You are responsible for the items on this list, including enabling source data verification and inspection of your signed consent forms, CRFs, IVRS, patient diaries, all site records, patient medical records, and facilities. Also for resolving any identified errors, omissions, illegible documents, or deficiencies. When the study is complete, the CRA will conduct a close-up visit for quality assurance purposes to ensure that all necessary documents have been completed and are available for review. For your close-up procedures, you need to ensure that all your clinical trial activities are reported recorded and reconciled according to the protocol, your SOPs, good clinical practices, and applicable regulations. You have been provided with a study closeout checklist. The key activities you're responsible for completing are the collection of all outstanding patient data, including diaries and completed questionnaires in all study forms, trial documentation and a final review of all study documents, reporting and follow-up of all adverse events and serious adverse events, resolution of outstanding case report forms and queries, having systems in place for new queries, and a timeline for database lock, 
accountability and return of IMP and all lab supplies, and ROB notification of trial completion. Hello, everyone. My name is Saurav, and I will cover the topics on investigator site file review, closing and review of the action items. The investigator site file is maintained by the investigator, and he has to ensure that the study is carried out as per the signed investigator statement, investigator plan, and all the relevant regulations. Investigator keep the information correct and up to date and are responsible for retaining all the data from the study before, during, and after it's completed. Study startup ISF documents. These are the list of the study startup documents. Continue. Now these are the study, during the study ISF documents. Continue. And now final study ISF documents. These are the final list of documents. Final investigational medical product, IMP accountability. Ensure that the drug was used according to protocol. Investigational medical product disposal should be documented if unused medicine is destroyed at the study site. Final trial closeout monitoring report, audit certificate, and clinical study report finding and interpretation. Now, closing and review of the action items. First, Final Statistical Data Analysis, SAP. The SAP should be produced any deviation. It should be produced any deviation from the original SAP and described. It will provide details on how the result is reported and presented. End of the study or study termination. If a study is terminated or suspended prematurely for any reason, the principal investigator must promptly notify REB in writing about the suspension the grounds for the suspension, and appropriate measures taken to ensure proper safety and proper therapy and follow-up for the participants, and the procedure followed for notifying the participants. The investigator then sends notification, a copy to GW. Study closeout documentation. Confirm that all protocol deviation has been noted in a source and reported to REB as appropriate. The sponsor will ensure that all regulatory documents and data are completed, recorded, and stored. Confirm final deposition of investigational medical product was complete. Dissemination of the results. The GW ensures that there is a responsibility under the regulatory guidelines to ensure that the results of scientific interest arising from this clinical study are appropriately published and shared. The GW will publish clinical trial results in National Research Journal and countrywide publications. Developed a plan to ensure that the outcomes for the clinical trial to relevant institutions, organizations, and participants. Finally, archiving of the records. After the clinical study completion or termination, the GW should ensure that all the documents, including participants' enrollment log, site monitoring visit log, and delegation of authority log is complete. GW will ensure that the record retention for minimum of 25 years. Without a proper written agreement between GW and investigator, no study document should be destroyed. If investigator wanted to assign a study record to another party or move to another location, in that case, he or she has to notify GW in writing about the new responsible person and location. Thank you, and if you have any questions, these are the references that we use in the slide. Carry forward, that's it. Thank you. Have a good day.